everybody. I'm Pastor AJ Houseman, and welcome to 10 Foot Pole, a podcast dig deeper into aspects of the Bible that get glossed over or totally ignored in most preaching. The Bible has a lot of parts that are racy, uncomfortable, and sometimes downright horrifying. Let's talk about it. Welcome to season two, episode 24. Today, our guest is Pastor Lauren Jenkins from Augustana Lutheran Church in Washington, D.C. And for hey. those that are out there like, oh, finally. <laughs> All the comments of, well, when are we going to get Lauren on the podcast? I'm like, sorry, she just keeps telling me no. She's got better things to do with her time. She's um fancy pastor. No. And <laughs> listen, uh, <laughs> You're getting me back, but good, because I finally said yes, and instead of getting like a cushy gospel lesson or something lovely to talk about, you're like, hey, you know what we should talk about today? I want to mm-hmm. talk about First Peter and suffering. Yeah. I would like to sit down with you and just reflect on all the bad shit that has ever happened ever in the whole world, mm-hmm. always. Mm-hmm. So, you know. That's listen, what you get. You know, Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Lesson learned, message received. <laughs> Y'all, the answer well, to AJ Houseman when she says, Do you want to be on the podcast? Say yes. See, this say is why person. your your delightful spouse has said yes to me twice. And we've had great conversations, you know. So just uh Yeah, he's good at the talking. He is um I was gonna say he's a professional, he is. And then I was like, wait, but like so are you. That's fair. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, that's a great segue into what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about um, the first Peter lesson for Sunday, May 21st, for those that are planning on going to a church. Um, first Peter chapter four, verses 12 to 14 and chapter five, verses six to 11. And today I'm going to read just from the regular old new revised standard version, because the weird sort of like this chapter, these chunk, and that chapter, these chunks. It's just too much work to like, I don't know, apparently copy and paste them separately. So I just copied and paste them together out of Sundays and Seasons because it was a lazy day. Okay, so here we are. Let's read it. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's suffering, sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a little bit of just background information on 1 Peter, which is why I made Pastor Lauren talk about this today, because we've never talked about it. Um, And there's been just too many, um, you know, uh, cushy gospel lessons lately that we've talked about. So we had to branch out. Um, The authorship of 1 Peter is what we call contested, meaning that scholars cannot agree who they think actually wrote it. It is traditionally attributed to Peter. Um, you know, Jesus's pal, the guy who denied him three times, that guy. Um, but most scholars date it in a place that like Peter most likely didn't write it for numerous reasons. The biggest one being is he was probably dead. Um, anyways, so that's, it's also pretty, uh, clear that it's not the same author as who wrote second Peter. They're pretty certain 
100% more people agree that was definitely not Peter that wrote that one. But this one's um, still contested depending on, you know, what spectrum of scholar you listen to. Um, the point of the letter is the author, um, whoever they may be, was writing to a bunch of Gentile Christians who were scattered um, and living sort of abroad away from like the main sort of like centerpiece um, in Israel um, area, I think mostly in like Asia Minor, which is now modern day Turkey, where they were experiencing a lot of persecution for, for being Christians. Um, and so it, I think it's it's supposed to be really a letter of like reassurance, um, but it comes across in a way that like, hey, I understand and you're experiencing a lot of persecution and suffering. Um, and like, that's good. You're supposed to do that for your faith, right? Like this is, yay, um, you're a good Christian because you're taking all that suffering. Um, that's, that's, I think, how it really comes off. This is a problem. So I think like one way to read it is like he tells them basically to suffer, right? That this... That, you know, retaliatory violence doesn't do anything. It's certainly not going to bring anybody to the faith, which is a, a really big deal to them, of course. Um, but that you should just take it, right? That that's what it means to be a good Christian is just to suffer in silence. Um, I think that's that's quite often um, what gets heard or told out of this book. Um, I like to read it another way that, like, the world kind of sucks. Um, and, yep, people are gonna judge you but like don't lose hope remember that you know you are still a chosen beloved child of god a little better anyways but a lot of suffering a lot of suffering and i think um one of the other things that's contested about the book of first peter is uh the kind of suffering that the author mm. is talking about um which again goes to the dating um uh, a little bit about what was going on in the world at the time and what the yeah. role of Rome was at the time um, and kind of the the movement of mass persecution of Christians and and when that fell. Um, so there's a there's a question about if the kind of persecution the author of First Peter is talking about is, you know, violence and, martyrdom sort mm -hmm. of you know at that level or if it's more at the level of like your friends and family not wanting to talk to you anymore because you've chosen this path and mm. because they they see your faith practices as um aberrant in some way mm -hmm. um or or something in between or all of the above uh, but it's interesting to just think about um the different kinds of suffering um especially when we talk about persecution um, and especially in our current U.S. context, when we, whenever the yeah. word persecution comes up, especially in relation to Christians, um, it, it triggers a lot of things for me and a need to be aware of the many ways that word can be used and interpreted and mm -hmm. experienced and that all of those persecutions are not necessarily created equal. Yeah. And, and also... I think, you know, it, to, to draw in question also, like, what is the role of suffering in life um, and what kinds of sufferings that there are and what, what is like suffering at the hands of like other people versus like, you know, let's say getting old and suffering and dying, you know, like just yeah. things like that. Like, it's very, very different. Yeah. Well, and, and also like, the conversation we're having today is is an important one, right? About that um, overarching theme of suffering, mm -hmm. which does come in um, many flavors of awful. Uh, First Peter is specifically talking about suffering because of your Christian witness, mm -hmm. right? And so... Um, there is a distinction to be made there as well, uh, you know, from a preaching perspective, for example, of like the kind of suffering that first Peter is talking about is related to being a disciple of Jesus mm -hmm. versus the other kinds of suffering that we might experience in our lives, whether it be an illness or a natural disaster or um, an injustice done um, 
you know, that, that may have nothing to do with our particular religious affiliation, um, but has to do with the brokenness in the world. Um, if, if that's where one believes suffering comes from, which may not be right. Like that's the big question, right? Why is there evil in the world? Why do people suffer? Why do bad things happen to good people? Mm -hmm. Why does God let this stuff happen? Um, why doesn't God intervene? Why does it seem like God intervenes sometimes, but not all the times? Like there, there's so much to explore around the topic of suffering that I think first Peter just gets us started on. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So the big topic overarching topic of, of all the questions that you just asked, um, are part of this conversation of the topic of theodicy, you know, the, this is, this is what Pastor Lauren's getting at about like, why, why do bad things happen and, and where is God when they do? Um, and I want to talk about that, but I want to go back to this little thing that you said, uh, um, you know, really drawing in that, like first Peter is talking about suffering for your faith. Um, and I want to tell you about like a, just a horrible, terrible example that like has been on my mind for like 20 years now. So I remember, um, I'm sure others do remember, um, the Columbine shooting in, um, in Columbine, Colorado. Um, this was, I think like this was a, the first school shooting or at least it is in my memory. I remember it was after this incident. This is when we started doing like active shooter drills in schools and stuff like that. I was in elementary school. Um, and I remember some of the interviews that they did with, um, kids that had survived that. And one of the kids was talking about, um, you know, hiding behind um, a desk or something like that when the shooter came in the room and looked at another student and said, are you a Christian? And that kid said, yes. And he shot him. Um, and that is something that has always stuck with me. Like, I, I don't honestly, like I've thought about it for like 20 years. Like, what would I have said? You know, like, or would it have even, I mean, it probably wouldn't have even mattered at, at that point in time, but like, I don't know when I think about this and what does it mean to really like stand up for your faith and like a, a, a midst of like that kind of like persecution, that's always like, cause it's such like a formidable memory for me as a child. Like that's the moment that like gets stuck in my head always. Sure. I remember that too. Um, I think her name was Cassie. Um, mm. I don't know why that name's sticking in my head. There's a book though called, she said, yes. Mm. Oh my gosh. Um, I didn't even know there was a book about it. Yeah. I, I remember this too. It's a, it was a formative memory for me. Um, especially cause I was just kind of, um, I don't know. I was just getting my faith footing at the time and figuring out what it might mean for me to mess with this Jesus guy. Um, yeah. and, and I mean, the reality is most of us we'll never be in that kind of situation, right? All we can do is hear that and imagine and wonder what we would do or what we would say. Um, I, I listen, this you, is the, I want you to know that like, as an adult reflecting like 20 years back on it, like what my response now is, is like, I would like to be the kind of Christian to make sure no one gets put in that place, that that's actually what it means to be a true follower of Jesus, to make sure that children are in a situation that someone's holding a gun to their head, right? Like I, you know, like I don't even necessarily like put myself in the shoes of that person anymore of just sort of like, from a, like looking in from a larger perspective of like, what should we be doing at Christians? If, if we truly are, you know, who we say we are, what, should our actual res response in those situations I, be, I don't know. That's yeah, and, where my brain and, hits now. And, and certainly like one cannot control someone else's um, every perception, but I do think the, the church universal needs to ask itself some really difficult questions about who we have been in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and the church in America right now needs to ask itself some, some pretty tough and direct and honest questions about who we are being mm -hmm. and why someone may have a response to a Christian that would be violent um, yeah. or, or that would be adversarial in some way. Um, what, what is it that would inspire that, um, in another person? 
So, I, and that's, that's not, it's, it's not apples to apples. It's not a one-to-one comparison. And I think, you know, in saying that I'm, I'm moving on from the Columbine no, example, right? But, but you're, I mean, but I think you're right though about of like, what, what should we be doing or asking? Um, Cause I, I think there is an amount of violence that the Christian church is inciting. And, and perpetrating. Well, yes. So yeah, it's, um, Peter doesn't address that though. Apparently he, that wasn't a problem. Well, you know, it's the, the classic history is written by the victors sort of situation, right? Like, yeah, we're reading, Mm. we're reading books in a library that, um, were canonized by a certain group of people for a certain group of people. So also true to remember to keep scripture in perspective yeah i think so one perspective with um definitely parts of what we read but also you know in the entirety of the content of the first peter is what has been relayed over time i think is kind of turning suffering into a spiritual practice yep um and glorifying it Mm -hmm. It's, it's it's really interesting uh, so this this first Peter lesson is matched with a reading from the Gospel of John that's eleven verses long, and in those eleven verses, glory or some uh, some form of the word glory shows up six times, six times in eleven verses. So there's a connection being made here, right? Yep. Um, by those who are assembling the lectionary, and on the one hand, yes, right, like we glory for Jesus looks different than glory in the world. Um, we find glory in a cross. It's not where you would typically look for it. Um, mm-hmm. and so, but the, the way that that has been interpreted in Christian tradition and, um, yeah, the way that's been interpreted in Christian tradition is that suffering is then the greatest good right? Jesus did it and we should be like Jesus. And so suffering does then become a spiritual practice or, Mm -hmm. or something that is, um, you know, I I've, I've heard for some people in their, um, in their faith and their understanding of how God works, um, that sufferings are gifts from God, right? These kind of tests that help them grow stronger. Um, and, you know, I always try to be careful about not, um, imposing my own theology on someone else. Um, that's certainly not how I understand suffering or how I understand how God works in the world, but that is an idea that's out there. And that has been, um, you know, perpetuated in, in Christian churches in mainline churches in the Lutheran church, even right. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not something that I've heard kind of out there. That's something I've heard parishioners say, um, you know, you hear things like God won't give you any more than you can handle. And, um, everything happens for a reason and all all that sort of stuff. All these horrible cliches that you just, first of all, pastors should never be saying. No, no, but, but they, they're in the ether somehow. Um, and, and it's, um, it's something to really combat. And I think one of the things, um, one of the ways to do that is to go back to Jesus's suffering and examine it with a little bit more of a critical eye. Um, since that's kind of where it all stems from, right? Mm-hmm. Jesus did it. So we should do it too. Um, but like that all presupposes that like God wanted Jesus to die. Right. Uh, which is a popular soteriology, a, a popular uh, theology yes. of salvation, right? God and so Soteriology Jesus. means sort of that, uh, your theory of like how Jesus saves. Yeah. That like God, God had this plan. God needed Jesus to die, to pay off some sort of debt, that the Mm -hmm. suffering is redemptive in some way, Um, which, you know, many people have said sort of makes God sound like a divine child abuser, Mm -hmm. uh, that God would plan for Jesus to suffer like this. Um, And, and also like, how weak is that God? that God needs to require human suffering to save humanity. I I don't know. I'm not attracted to that personally. Um, I I wrote a paper in 2017 about theodicy and kind of challenging exactly what you're saying there about like, if that is sort of the theology, like that, you know, makes God a sadist, right? And it doesn't 
jive, I think, with the rest of the um, promises that God has made. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And and there are other ways to look at it, right? It seems because of the the scripture that gets pulled out when we talk like around Easter and we, we read um, the passion narrative over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, that's, that's when we think about this, this Jesus dying and rising again and how and why and all that, but there's evidence throughout the gospels that Jesus didn't have to die to save us. Um, and there's, so there's, there's a whole branch of soteriology called nonviolent atonement theory um, that I love. Um, uh, one of, one of the authors that, that I've read that who I really like is Jay Denny Weaver, um, who has this nonviolent atonement theory that says it's not Jesus's death that saves us, at least not on its own. It's Jesus's whole life. It's, it's the incarnation. It's God coming and walking among us. That is salvific. Mm -hmm. It is Jesus's life and example and teachings that are salvific and, and in dying in this way, um, as we all die, it is the solidarity of God with humanity that is salvific, mm. not Jesus's suffering, not this like violence pornography that we lift up. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, so I think about like the story of Zacchaeus, for example, right. Mm -hmm. In the story of Zacchaeus, there's this, this line that gets thrown away. I think where Jesus says today, salvation has come to this house. Mm. Well, Jesus ain't dead yet. Yeah. So how's that true, right? Like today, salvation has come to this house. God is able to save without suffering. Mm -hmm. God is able to save without violence. It is not God's desire for suffering to happen. God desires human flourishing. That being said, I think God knew full well that when God put on skin and came down and entered the world, there was no way the world would bear it. Mm -hmm. So I think God was aware that suffering was going to happen, that Jesus was going to die. Um, yeah. It says more about, it says more about humans than it does about God. Yeah. And what it does say about God is that God's not scared to join us hmm. in those, in those moments that God's not interested in, sitting on some sort of throne in the sky, but wants to be completely with us so that no matter what's happening, no matter what the suffering, no matter what kind of God forsaken experience we think we're having, in fact, God would be right there with us. Mm -hmm. I I say too, I, I've said this before, maybe not on the podcast, maybe that was in a sermon. Sometimes I get those muddled together. Um, that if all that mattered was that Jesus was this scapegoat or this pound of flesh that had to be sacrificed, why are there so many chapters in this book? What, why did, you know, all the versions of the accounts of Jesus's life include all of these things? Because if those things weren't important, they wouldn't be there. Right. Right. We could have just told you he was born and then how he, how he, how he died. But all those things in the middle do matter. And that was the point. They matter greatly. And then not to mention, right, we're still in the Easter season, the resurrection on the other side of all of that, right? That Jesus dies, but he doesn't stay dead. Yeah. That's not the last word. And so for suffering then to become central to a Christian identity as some sort of um, like good to aspire to. Mm -hmm. or to blithely accept or to try to credit God with, um, again, that just doesn't jive with my understanding of who God is in the world, what Jesus came to accomplish, even the story of his life. Um, well, so there's this, um, this sort of mainstream perpetuation of this idea that like, you're supposed to suffer in this life so that you get the good things in the next life, right? That that's this idea that has taken hold that like, you're supposed to suffer here so that after you die, you get to go to a magical place where everything is joyful and beautiful and all the things. Um, and we have talked about this on the podcast is that idea is not grounded in our gospel messages, nor is it grounded um, in, in, in our scriptures. That's something nor, that has taken hold later. Nor does it have any kind of integrity. 
for people right. who would want to follow Jesus, right? Like if you believe that some place like what we call heaven exists, some place where people are not hungry and where tears are wiped away, right? No one grieves alone. Um, no one is, no one is abandoned in that way. If, if we believe that this place is possible, understanding that we are not God, right? <laughs> like we cannot, uh, uh, create our own heaven, but like, why wouldn't we aspire to that? Why wouldn't we say that's the vision that God has for the world? That is yeah. what God is calling us into and at least approximate that as best as we can moment by moment in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that that is kind of the most fundamental <laughs> calling of a Christian, right? Not to force people to be converted or to no. not even to theologize and to try to understand, but to it is say, to okay. help manifest the kingdom in the right. here and now, especially in, you know, we're still in the gospel of John times and the Johanna. And that's like, it's all about this here and now kingdom. Yes. This is our job to work towards it. Yes. And yes, if this is what God wants for us why do we glorify suffering that somehow that's what God wants for you is to suffer? Yeah. And so I think, I think that the church has a role then in, in saying something different, mm -hmm. right? Where we can be, we can be good sometimes at talking about what we're against, right? Uh, these theologies that we dislike, or Christian perspectives we dislike. Yeah. Um, but I think we need to grow into um, better articula uh, articulating um, for ourselves and for one another the theologies that are, are life giving. Yeah. And so, so yeah. And I think just like just that, like, right, like I want your theology to be life giving. Yeah. Um, Dr. Jennifer Callan is an associate professor of religious studies at Iona College says the universality of suffering, however, should not be mistaken for the necessity of it. Mm, yeah, that's it. Thank I like you, that Dr. a lot. Callan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there, um, there's also, so to kind of break down, like kind of kinds of suffering, like, you know, like first Peter really dives into this whole, um, sort of, you know suffering for your faith kind of thing. Um, but I think, so when you had mentioned sort of some of the, you know, the religious platitudes that often, uh, you know, can be given, I think um, someone has shared with me recently that like a while ago now, many years, um, a very close family member had died and the pastor just, you know, gave that he's in a better place. Mm this family has never set foot in a church since if that's, if that's, if that's it, that's all we, we have to offer in times as the Christian church of, of people suffering deep, deep grief, um, you know, for the loss of a family member, you know? Yeah. I mean, we, we can do a lot better, I think. Um, well, but to break... saying oh, nothing is better. <laughs> Right. Yeah, Just I do, I do agree with that. Yep. Saying nothing is better. Um, showing up and and just being with someone is is better. Um, mm -hmm. I think words words often do fail us, and I think that's why, um, we reach for those kinds of platitudes. Um, because words sometimes fail us. They do, and I, I think it takes some discipline to not um, not regurgitate some of those. Yeah, I think for me, my immediate response in my head was, oh, well, that pastor clearly didn't do CPE. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think about, so there, there are different kinds of, of suffering in the world. Like not, not only is there different, like sort of like physical, psychological stuff, but I mean, um, when we break down, I think the different kinds of suffering, like, yes, if you fall and scrape your knee, that hurts, but like, that's a different kind of suffering than if someone hits you in the knee, right? Like there's, there's, I think there's suffering that like humans cause, or, you know, that, that, that we cause other people, um, and, and violence. And then I think that there's sort of like, 
there are natural sufferings as a part of the world. And I think it's important, at least for me and my theology and understanding, especially of, of if we're talking about theodicy, is to separate those. Mm-hmm. Um, because like the, the natural world, the world in which, you know, God created has birth and death. Um, you know, we are given pain sensories. Those were actually like, that's a good thing. Like we need to know, um, that like something hurts or something's hot so that you don't keep touching it. You know, like there's, there are all these things that, you know, kind of get built into what it means to be a part of this natural world, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad, but then there is a version of suffering that I think that like we can do something about that. If, you know, if we, we talk about our, our Paul is a Christian um, to focus on those things, yeah. much of which is caused by human hands. I was going to say like, even some of those things within the natural world, mm-hmm. um, you know, there, there have been natural disaster. There's, there's flooding in scripture, right? There's been natural disasters for, for all of natural history. That being said, we know yeah. that humans are impacting climate change and there may be a call for us to do something about that because we know that it will create more suffering and needless suffering and that that suffering will impact disproportionately mm-hmm. people who live in poverty, um, people of color, people around the world who are in vulnerable positions and don't have somewhere else they can just go. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of a twofer of suffering, right? Um, yeah. The suffering of uh, the natural world and how it impacts human life and existence within it, um, and also animal life and existence within it, mm-hmm. but then human impact on that and and what we've done mm-hmm. to contribute to pain. So the theologian Daniel Migliori um, kind of labels these as natural evil and moral evil. Mm-hmm. And so moral evil then is is in the is the realm of what I would define as sin, where you are doing whether what you do or do not do that hurts yourself, others, um, or creation, right? And so these are the decisions that we make. And and of course, like there are things that like you you can't fix all of it right like there there's just there are systems in play that like everyone would have to you know needs to work together but like as an individual i i think people like to focus on the individual sins well mm. i didn't hurt anybody well you know maybe you did how much you know emissions are you burning and where is that depleting the ozone layer and whose house flooded because of it you know like those so there's these bigger picture things that i think when we wrap our head around it's just like it's, Mi- it's hard to conceptualize. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we do, we, we like to, um, I mean, going all the way back to Jesus, we love a scapegoat, right? So we love yeah. to be able to point to a person, um, or a group of people who we can blame for suffering. Um, right. I, it, uh, actually makes me think of, uh, slight, slight, uh, sidebar here, mm-hmm. um, in the movie, the American president, uh, which is like an old nineties fabulous film um there's a statement made you you know how you win elections you tell people what to be afraid of and who to blame for it Mm -hmm. and that was prophetic and Mm -hmm. turned out in fact to be uh basically our our political strategy these days but not even just these days that actually stems back um even before the the reagan era some I was reading some like crazy books that there's actually like one person that perpetuated a lot of that stuff um, is kind of like the root of what, anyways, it's, it's nuts, but, but it works because it's human nature, right? We do, we do, Mm -hmm. um, we are inclined to want to point a finger and be able to place blame outside of ourselves. Yeah. That being said, Christians also sometimes really gravitate toward that, like self-flagellation, like. I'm bad. I'm sinful. So yes. like it's, it's like a me and Jesus thing. And yes, I Martin got to get right, you know, like, woof. Um, and, and that's not really helpful either. <laughs> so I, I think so many of the things that we're facing right now as humanity, as a creation are systemic issues. Mm-hmm. 
which is not to say that as individuals, there aren't responses we can and should have and things we should be doing and saying about it. But it it forces us to take a different approach than perhaps we are biologically programmed to take, which is a very kind of evolutionary, mm. how, how do I move through the world in such a way? And more of a communal yeah. way of being in the world. And- we have talked about this a lot on the podcast is remember, you know, the John 316 always comes with John 317 and also recognizing that like, you know, to save it's the cosmos. It's not humans. It's not you. It's the whole world and understanding yeah. that is together. And in all the places, many of which where we hear this, like you, it's is usually a you all. It just doesn't translate that well into English. It's it's plural. It's always plural that you are meant to be in community, that we are meant to be doing this and changing and growing and caring together. Yeah. Um, and I I really do believe like I think God doesn't care so much about your individual if you smoked or gambled, God cares more about like, you know, that thing, like, are you making choices that a village in the Caribbean isn't going to get flooded and drowned? You know, like, I, I really think that like that collective, like, what are we doing to take care of everyone? What are we doing to take care of others on a larger scale? What are we doing to care for? Like, to me, it's more of a don't not do this, but rather do these things. Yeah. But that's a more helpful way to look at what our behavior as a Christian should be. Mm, well, it, so that that takes me to like all of Luther's explications of the commandments. Sure. Uh, that he takes all the prohibitions and he turns them positive. Yep. Um, and and so I think that's that's kind of baked into our Lutheran understanding too of like, yeah. Who are we to be? What are we freed for? Right. Yeah. We're, okay, great. So we're saved for what? Um, and it's not just to like get through the day and then die and go to heaven. Like yeah. that's not it. Um, there's more this, there. Yeah. That this is um, not what God wants for us. Yeah. Well, and so you also said something really interesting that I want to go back to about mm-hmm. um God's awareness being for the whole cosmos. And therefore, perhaps our awareness um, yep. should be larger than our immediate sphere of mm-hmm. reality. Well, even just and, in, in humans, right? Like larger than just yeah. the human population. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that's true. And it goes back to the reading in First Peter. Um, it is significant, I think, that in um, verse 9, the author writes, your siblings in all the world are suffering, right? So even speaking to this community at the time who like no internet, no, no snail mail really, even as we understand it, like not a great way to communicate across large distances Mm -hmm. for most people in most cases. And even then the spirit of God was trying to tell the Christian community you know, your reality is not the only reality. There are other people. There are other parts of the world. There is more than just this. Mm -hmm. And I care about all of it. And I know, and I'm aware of all of it. And I'm holding all of it. And I'm asking you, my people to be a little more aware of all of it. (laughs) Well, I also think it's humbling and also recognizing one about saying like, listen, it's not all about you. Uh, other people have problems too, but also the, Hey, you're not alone in this either. Yeah. And I think sometimes like, you know, when it talks about the devil prowling around here, like a lion, I think that this is sometimes where, you know, the, the evil can really kind of sift and perpetuate in when it makes us feel like we're alone. I, when that depression that monster is- makes you feel like you're alone, that's, you know, that's, that's the suffering. Like that's, that's the worst, um, of the evil winning. I, I agree. I think, listen, if there is a devil, that's, that's the devil's greatest lie. Mm-hmm. Is that, that you're we're alone? alone. Mm-hmm. Cause it is so convincing. And there are so many things, uh, you know, so many experiences that we have, um, things we go through ways. We feel lies. Our brains tell us, Mm -hmm. Um, it is so easy to believe that lie and 
it is the kind of lie that can obliterate hope. Yeah. Well, it goes along with this, like that, like suffering that like you're supposed to suffer. And so when you couple this idea of this, this spiritual suffering that you're supposed to suffer and that you're all alone, that it's devastating. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm sitting here near tears, frankly, like it's devastating. Because this is the, I think you're right. Like that's the greatest lie. And I think that that lie that gets just so steeped in, in our heads, right. Causes the most damage. Yeah. And so if anything, I hope that what people get out of first Peter is not that you should suffer. It's that you aren't alone. Right. There's a good sermon in there somewhere. Mm. Amen. Can I tell you, um, so I put together this project also in seminary, um, and I still keep meaning to actually like utilize it at some point in time, but I need a group of people that's actually be dedicated to doing it. Um, I put together a theological sort of Bible study thing around 1980s children's movies, um, particularly um, by Don Bluth, who is was considered the anti-Disney in the 80s. When Disney was really focusing on princesses and stuff, he said, you know what, I'm going to write children's movies about real things that matter, that kids need to hear the real stuff. Um, and so all of his movies are very dark and alarming. And sometimes I watch them now and can't believe we watch those as children. What are, can you give me an example? The Secret um, of Nim. Oh, yep. That's what I thought you were talking uh, about. The American Tale, you know, where these Jewish mice uh, flee persecution in Russia and come to the United States where they get shit on um, by everything because it's not the land of milk and honey. Um, the Land Before Time, um, where you know, the dinosaurs all die. Um, all dogs go to heaven, which is just, this is the real movie. Like if you want to do a fascinating, um, sort of like theological study on everything about all dogs go to heaven is also, it's a terrible movie for kids. Like the whole point is like, he, he breaks out of prison. He goes to a betting club. Um, they get him drunk and then try to, well, they do kill him. That's when he goes to heaven and then escapes again. This is like the first five minutes of the movie. And you're like, Oh my goodness. My parents, I don't even think they even thought about it. They're just like, oh, puppies, it's cute. And then after he, you know, after he steals St. Peter's halo, I think it is, and then comes back to heaven, he kidnaps a kid. It's it's a whole thing. Um, anyways, as a part of this study, um, one of the like sessions um, that one of the weeks is, so you would, you would watch The Land Before Time. And then you would talk about, um, you would talk about uh, some prompt questions about uh, theodicy. It's a great, um, it's a very sad movie and also a great movie about um, this, this conversation of like, kind of, you know, where's God when bad things happen. Um, And do you watch Lamb Before Time? Oh, yeah. Okay. The first one, I, I understand there's now like 25 of them, but I believe Don Bluth is only responsible for the first two. I only watched the first one. Okay. The second one's not too bad too. All right. Noted. But anyways, so um, the big earth shake, um, which kills the little dinosaur Littlefoot's mom. Um, and then he has to go by himself to try to find his uh, grandparents in the Great Valley, which is again, given that whole like, valley of milk and honey um uh the promised land kind of vibe um and you know a lot of things happen he almost dies like a lot of things is like this you know little abandoned child but he makes some friends along the way um and ultimately like they work together to get there uh and i just it's a it's a very sad movie i i have um as becoming a parent i can't do any of the movies with the dead parents and there are so many dead parents in in all of these like young kids movies and i'm like why are we putting that in their brain like putting that much anxiety on these children that something is going to happen to us um but you know that that topic of conversation bad bad things do happen the bad things happen and how I think it's a matter, I think of like, how do we make sense of the world when they do? Mm. 
you know, what, what do we do in those circumstances? And I think also for, um, you know, us as pastors is we, we find ourselves uh, quite frequently, um, in these kind of situations with people. Um, and so then what, you know, is sort of our lens and how we walk with people in processing, what do we do when bad things happen and where is God in, in those moments? Right. Um, and so when you, when I think of a movie, like again, for children, um, where this sort of devastating thing happens to this, you know, young child and what happens afterward, how does he process it? And, you know, I, I think, well, I think, so go ahead. So, I mean, you brought up the land before time, right. And Littlefoot has to go alone. Mm -hmm. He thinks, yeah. but he, he finds some friends along the way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important part of, um, the storytellers meaning making. That is what I was trying to to get at I think uh because it draws us back to that whole thing of remembering like you're you're not alone like that is a lie that's the lie that's being told um which doesn't make it okay that the bad thing happened right, right? yes that doesn't bring Littlefoot's mother back and it mm -hmm. doesn't make it okay that she died mm -hmm. um and I think that's really important that we we not whether it's using platitudes or silver lining things or I needed another angel. Oh God. Don't ever it. say that to no. someone. So, but however it is, we're doing it. Um, that it, it's important. We not try to erase the reality of what has happened, but look for where God is showing up in the aftermath. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and that's the thing. Like, I, I think that God is, is most close to those who are suffering mm -hmm. and, um, got little footprints in the in sand vibe there. Ugh. I, I don't, I don't know how to take that. I don't, I don't feel great about that actually. It's not bad though. That's why it's popular. I know. I know. Can they be dinosaur footprints in the sand? Of course. Okay. Yeah. I feel, I feel little, good about Littlefoot's it. little. Well, Littlefoot's little buddies. Yeah. I um. So sort of my approach when I think about like where is God in in the midst of suffering, um. Looking for God in the aftermath. I th I think you're right there. Um. Because again, like so, even just you know thinking about what happened with the earth shake, earth shake and you know Littlefoot's mom, is this would fall under that classification of of a natural disaster, right? Um, so is it anyone's fault? But rather, you know, then natural things happen. Where is God in the midst of that, right? But in the aftermath, and in, in in the you know in the people that find Littlefoot and guide him and help him process and grieve and. Um, that community, right? Like we're here as a whole. We're not, we're not, you're not isolated. You're not alone. That's, that's not the hope. That's not what God wants for you. And then I think about also, you know, when we talk about the suffering that is caused by other humans um, at, at the course of human hands and where is God in the midst of that suffering? I like um, Ellie Wessel's night as a, as an indication about where I think God is in the midst of that. This is my theology anyways. Um, uh, he writes about an experience, his experience as a, he's Jewish, writes about experience in concentration camp um, and, and asks this question, you know, where is God? Um, and as he is watching um, a boy being uh, hanged, he says, God is on the gallows, mm -hmm. right? That when we, when we do this, we are hurting God we are killing God. Um, a few years ago after the, um, the shooting at the LGBT nightclub in Orlando, um, that was sort of the approach that, that the ELCA providing presiding Bishop Eaton kind of said too, when she said, um, you know, we are killing ourselves. Yeah. When we decided that they aren't from the same arm of humanity as the rest of us. Yeah. 
that's my working uh, theology. No, I think I think it's um that resonates with me. Um, it resonates with me. It um saddens me. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh. Remember when I invited you on the podcast for all the oh. easy fluffy talk today? Yeah. Um. You know, it it makes me think of it. We have a low anthropology as Lutherans. We don't. Mm. We're mer- worms, merely worms, right? Yes. All, all in need of saving, and so it's it's unsurprising then that humans would, um, would hurt, would would kill, would would mm-hmm. mess up, um, from time to time, and that it's only God working through us that we can do anything other. Um, and so thank God for God working in the world. Um. It's also um what you said resonates because um because of you know my my understanding of of God and where God is in relation to us um the idea of like uh panentheism right that everything exists within God's self mm-hmm. and therefore everything is innately holy mm. um including us <laughs> in all of our sinfulness, um, but also including all of creation, all of the cosmos, um, you know, this microphone I'm speaking into Mm -hmm. this plant I'm looking at, um, you know, that, that God is, is bigger than, and holding all of that within God's very self. And so there are parts of God that we can't know that are bigger than reality, bigger than everything that is. Um, parts of God that are completely ineffable, the parts of God that we ask these sorts of questions of, mm. um, that we have these wonderings about, that we, are may, we may or may not ever have answers to. We just wonder and we we, we pursue. Um, and then there are parts of God that are so imminent that are in us and in that friend who's walking with us and mm-hmm. in the creation we're called to care for. Mm. Um and God is there also in these ways we can know, um, and that we can then also take some responsibility for. Um, and so when, when you say, when, when people cause harm, when people do violence, um, to one another or to the creation, we are killing God, right? Quite Mm -hmm. literally. Um, and, when we accompany one another in the aftermath of that, when we try to do better, Mm -hmm. when we speak and act into existence, a world that more closely approximates the world we think God imagined, right? That, that vision of the kingdom of heaven that, you know, we say we believe in. I think that's an answer to suffering that isn't a platitude, right? And it does take a lot of work and it may even bear its own suffering as a result of doing it, right? Um, you know, I when I think about nonviolent atonement theory, I also think about Martin Luther King Jr. When he was doing his work, he said on multiple occasions that he knew he was going to be assassinated. He wasn't Mm. asking to be assassinated. He did not want to be assassinated, right? But he knew that if he kept talking the way he was talking and doing the things he was doing, that in all likelihood, at some point, someone would Mm. kill him for it. Mm. And that's Christ-like. I don't think it glorifies suffering, but it acknowledges that the world is broken. Mm Mm-hmm. And that in our response to a broken world and in our, our desire and attempts to build a world that is more loving, where there is less suffering, there is risk in that also. And so that takes me then back to First Peter and these mm. reassurances that the author is trying to give that early Christian community that it's worth it. Mm. The God of all grace has Mm. called you, will restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. 
Yeah, the God of all grace. Mm -hmm. I was taught a hermeneutic once um, that whatever the passage, a great question to ask is in, in this text, who is God for us? Hmm. And who is God asking us to be for God? Hmm. Who is God for us and who are we as God's people? Hmm. And that has often helped me. Um, that is a great way to read scripture. And also when you put, I think also, you know, putting that perspective on the scripture it's very life-giving yeah hmm. thank you for joining me today thanks for, for asking me for finally saying yes and Ooh. sharing in this heavy but great conversation thanks for your patience thanks for <laughs> asking over and over again thanks also for being one of the people in um, my life who reminds me that I am not alone. Mm. Same to you, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks um, for our listeners. You can learn more about the podcast at 10footfullpodcast.com and find us on Facebook and Instagram at 10footfullpodcast and wherever you listen to podcasts. And the 10 Foot Pole Podcast is a ministry of the Delaware, Maryland Synod. To learn more, go to demdsynod.org. Take care, everyone. And remember, you are not alone.